Hi again, welcome to Module 4. Module 4 is all about think blocks. In Module 3, we talked about DSRP diagrams, which are really similar to think blocks, but a little bit different. One's a visual tool, one's a visual tactile tool. And so in this module, we're really getting into think blocks themselves, and we're gonna learn how to use them, how to move them around the table, all the stuff that goes into actually getting in and using think blocks. If you know how to DSRP diagram, you also already know how to use think blocks and vice versa because they're really completely correlated. Um, for example, if you draw a square or a circle or, or a triangle in a diagram, that's just like using a large block or a medium block or a small block. Um, if you want to relate two things together, we can do that with uh, think blocks or we can do it with diagrams. If you want to put some parts into uh, a, a, a hole or put that hole into a larger hole. We can do that with think blocks or we can do it with diagrams. So we're using the same language just in different tools. If you want to do a perspective with diagrams, the same way that you would draw that perspective on a, on a square on a page, we do the same thing with a block. So there's the perspective on this object. So the blocks and the diagrams are completely correlated with each other. They're paralleling each other. If you know how to do one, you really know how to do the other, even though you might not think you do. The purpose of all these tools, whether it's think blocks or DSRP diagrams or the guiding questions or the basic mindset of DSRP, is to conceptualize, capture, and communicate. Three really important things. Um, it's not only important to, for kids to be able to think about their thinking or be metacognitive, but to be able to capture their thinking, um, to, to, to draw it or to physically model it or to write it down in a, in a series of, of words. And the, the important thing there is that they're able to then take that captured idea and communicate it. Not only to communicate it to, to make an argument or to make a point about something in, in, in their life, but to communicate their thinking to their teachers or to, to, have the, uh, to, to have a conversation, to be able to have a language of thinking so that kids can interact with each other or interact with their teachers about their thinking. So I want to give you just a quick uh, sort of experiential or dramatic demonstration. I'm going to give you the same, the same content in three different ways. So the first one is this one. The United States government has three branches. Good enough, right? Uh, the second demonstration is this one. The United States government has three branches. That's the second example. Now here's, here's the third example. The United States government has three branches. Now what you've just experienced is a very subtle difference in, in three different explanations of essentially the same content. The first one was made up of only language, only spoken language. I didn't do any gestures or body language or anything like that. In the second one, I used a little bit of gesture. The United States government is made up of three parts. In the third example, I used blocks. You still have the language learning, you still have some of the gesture, but you're incorporating tactile manipulatives that the kid can sort of grasp onto the concepts, and you're incorporating a part whole underlying structure to the ideas. When we teach in this third way, where we're using lots of different integrated techniques, um, what we're doing is speaking to the human brain. We're causing that, if we, if we look at that human brain in those three scenarios, uh, we're seeing you know, the brain lights up at the language center in the first, the brain starts to light up in the visual centers and the language centers in the second, and in the, in the, in the third fMRI, the brain sort of lights up like a Christmas tree. It's hitting on lots and lots of different parts of the brain and different parts of the learner. Increased neuronal connections means deeper understanding, increased recall, increased memory. You do better on tests. And so this third example, while subtly different, is, is in terms of learning, uh, importantly different. For those of you who are interested in a, a deeper treatment of the importance of tactile manipulatives and play uh, in education and for learning, Dr. Colosi and I 
just recently published an article in Scientific American Mind that has some of the background research and the, that, that goes over sort of the importance of all these things. Some of you may be familiar with these blocks. Now, these, we call these version 1.0 and these ones version 2.0. The version 2.0 think blocks really were simplified um, based on lots and lots of teacher feedback and um, we think that they're just easier to use, but there's no reason why you can't use both of them. Um, we want to point that out because many of the videos that you'll see that are online of teacher case studies, you'll see these types of blocks, and we want you to just be familiar with the fact that they're just different versions of the same thing. Importantly, um, they're still dry erasable, we can still make relationships between them, etc. They're still nestable for part whole, but they're transparent. That was kind of a big decision to make um, from the white to the transparent. And part of the reason we do that is one, to be able to see what's inside of them, but two, to communicate something very, very important. And that is that all ideas have an invisible structure underneath them that most students don't see. They don't see that underlying structure of the idea. And so it's, in a sense, what we're communicating is almost metaphorical, which is because the blocks are sort of transparent and almost invisible, what we're communicating is that invisible structure that's underneath. What blocks do is they show the structure of ideas and they help kids learn the underlying structure at the same time that they're learning the superficial content. Tactile manipulatives have really gotten short shrift in education writ large. If you, if you look at the existing tactile manipulatives, what you'll see is that predominantly they exist in the lower grades and in mathematics almost exclusively. As you get older, you see less and less tactile manipulatives. And by the time you get to high school, you don't see any. And of course, you'd never see any uh, anywhere in, in college or, or grad school. Um, this is really is, is, a, is a mistake educationally because tactile manipulatives in many ways are more useful the more complex or complicated the ideas get. So the more sophisticated the ideas get, the more you really need to grasp them and distinguish them and make them for, sort of physical in order to understand them. Watson and Crick, the, the people who discovered DNA, a very, very complex idea, um, and the double helix, uh, what they were fond of saying was that they couldn't have possibly discovered the double helix structure and DNA without having built a physical model of it. The idea behind think blocks was to create a tactile manipulative that could be used in any grade for any topic, not just mathematics, not just third grade. You could use them for history. You could use them for art. You could use them for PE. You can literally use think blocks in any grade any topic and across the spectrum uh, in businesses, CEOs, innovators, scientists, etc. Whether it's grade school or grad school, the more sophisticated the ideas get, the more important tactile manipulatives are in communicating and understanding those ideas. So let's get started with using the blocks and I've asked Laura to come in and help us with uh, making sure that we uh, don't just talk about the abstract aspect of it but also get to the practical and, and, and use examples. Um, sometimes I can be a little abstract. The first thing is distinctions, right? With DSRP diagrams, we learn that when we draw a square or a circle or a triangle, we are distinguishing something from something else just by using a different shape and labeling it. Well, the same is true with blocks. We have large blocks, we have medium blocks, and we have small blocks. Of course, we can further distinguish it by using a dry erase marker on the blocks. So we can say this block is, is dog. So what you're saying is we're using both the, the shape, the physicality of the block, yep. and the word yep. to make a distinction. Yep. Not only that, but for example, you can, you, can take a, uh, you can take a block and just you could just have that block and, and, and say that block is the Civil War. By putting this block out there and saying it's the Civil War, you're essentially saying this is an idea, this is a concept that sort of stands on its own. So if you were a teacher, and you wanted to understand what I was thinking about the Civil War, maybe to assess sort of my prior knowledge about it before you start a unit, yeah. you'd say, let's pretend this is the Civil War. Tell me about it. What do you think about when you think yeah, about the Civil War? Yeah, what do you think War? about when you think about the Civil War? And you might and say... And I would say, I think about slavery, I think so about the North slavery and the South. And Got so it. now we're starting to do a part-whole system in order to further distinguish the Civil War. When you see a block, a distinction of any kind, 
that you're seeing both the identity and the other, even though it might not be visible to you. So if this is a distinct thing, an identity. Let's start with dog. Let's start with dog. Okay. So there's what? There's dog. Now, the dictionary definition of dog is what we would think of as being this block. That's what dog is. We could use the thesaurus here for the other, and this could be including all the things that are sort of synonymous with dog, but are not exactly the same as dog. In other words, they're close to being dog, but they're different. Right. They're distinctly different from dog. And then we could go even, even further using the thesaurus to say, well, these things are the antonyms of dog. And you notice that in doing that, from the dictionary definition of dog to the synonyms of dog to the antonyms of dog, you have, in a sense, created a very robust distinction of this new vocab word, dog. Now, that could be any word. So we understand yep. what something is by understanding sort of it on a continuum of what it isn't. Absolutely. Moving out from familiar to not familiar. Absolutely. And not only that, but our two primary tools for language, the dictionary and the thesaurus, are really getting at distinctions, identity, other. So you have identity, other, based on the you know, dictionary and thesaurus. Isn't that interesting? It's really interesting. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about, um, remember Shani Brown, who did mm -hmm. What is a Scientist? Yeah. So, like, if you put the word scientist here, yep. and you said, what is a scientist, then you'd get into, kids would say things like biologist, chemist, engineer, whatever. Absolutely. And then, the, and then, then as they get further out, I've even heard kids say things like couch, banana, bumblebee. Like, so they go, like, from what's familiar and, and similar to things that are totally the opposite. Absolutely. Or totally different. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And you could even put in, you know, not scientist and scientist. And you could ask kids to think a lot about, hey, what, are, what is a scientist? Well, you know, they're, they're, you know, they study things, they have a lab, et cetera. And what is not a scientist? Well, a priest is not a, a scientist, philosopher. a philosopher. He doesn't have a lab. So you're making a distinction there. If you think about Danielle Dess, who had the hard job of trying to get her students to understand the concept of torture. She would use the exact same model. Absolutely. What is a scientist, what is not a scientist, is really the same as the national debate of what, is, what constitutes torture and what does not constitute torture. That, that might seem like a very uh, you know, uh, complicated debate, but really, fundamentally, it's about making a single distinction, torture and not torture. Sometimes in our diagrams, we use a little symbol at the corner of the square. We call that the distinction symbol. We can do the same thing on our blocks like that. All that's doing is pointing out, hey, this is a really important distinction that's being made. So it's a way for teachers to communicate, hey, pay attention to pay this attention. one. This is the one that matters. This is what we're zeroing in on. Even though there's a bunch of other <clears throat> stuff, this is the thing that we're trying to yeah. get. Remember Sarah Lafayette? Mm -hmm. She had her students build an entire timeline of all of the major wars yep. on blocks in her classroom in, in hopes of understanding one point in time. Absolutely. So again, if we're really trying to distinguish this point in time, we're going to use all this other in stuff, context. this other stuff, to really distinguish what is interesting or different about this point in time. So we use that little symbol there to indicate, hey, yeah, we're talking about all these other things, these other wars in a timeline, but really we're trying to distinguish this that thing point. here from in all history. those other ideas. So you want to do a test? Oh, I hate tests. <laughs> Let's do one. Okay. How many distinctions are there? There's at least one. There's at least one. there's one block. Okay. Now how many are there? Well, there's five. There's at least five at distinctions. Least five. Right? So every time you put a block down, just like any time you put a shape down, it, you're creating some kind of identity, and that identity is interacting with the other shapes or blocks and uh, essentially becoming meaning. Well, what if I took out the big block mm -hmm. and I put in five little blocks? How do I know which one is the identity? Ah, that's a good question. They're all identities and they're all others. For example, this one might be A and this was B, C, D, E. Well, all of these things can be not A. Right. But if this one is B, then all of these are not B. Right. And if this one is C, then all of these are not, not C. C. 
That's identity other. We're going to move from distinctions, which is made up of identity and other, and we're going to go to systems, um, which is made up of parts and wholes. And so remember that in diagramming, we use squares, circles, and triangles to create a part-whole structure. So triangles go into circles, and circles go into squares. And really all we're doing is mimicking the structure of the block. Medium blocks go into large blocks, and small blocks go into medium blocks. But I think what's really cool and what I've seen students really love is the understanding that this middle idea is a part of this bigger idea, but it also has parts. And kids really get excited by this nested structure of any idea that they can think about. And they think it's really cool that this one thing can be both a whole and a part at the same time. In terms of using them, what we're doing when we're creating systems, for example, is we're grouping or sorting or pulling a bunch of parts together. You can put these inside of each other or you can lay them out in front. Sometimes you really want to see them out in front. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a system, so is this. This could also be a system. We could use the blocks like that. We could take a group of parts and put them into a block like that and that's a system, yep. right? Sometimes you might want to grab a group like this you know, and put them inside. Yeah, or like you that. could put yep. everything and make that one big system. One big system that has all of them. You can play, sort of freeform it with kids, and you can say, okay, let's say this is a dog, and let's say this is a cat, and this is a goat, and this is a hamster. And you can say, well, if I put the dog with the cat, I can call this system pets. Yep. Well, I could add the hamster to that too. So I've got a system here called pets and a system here called farm animals, right? You can also say, for example, put a, a chicken in the mix and you can mix the dog and the chicken. And in some places, this could be a system called food or meat. There's really a limitless amount of possibilities in terms of what you can do with these blocks. I remember a pre-K classroom was talking about uh, the idea of community and community helpers. And so uh, these little kids would label this a policeman, a fireman, a mailman, and a school garbage teacher. Man. St oh, school and teacher. a garbage man. Yeah. And so this was their idea, their construct of what uh, community helpers was made up of these five people. We could go even up, up in the grades to yeah. something like an expression and an equation. Yep. Right? Let's use bigger blocks so we can really see it. You know, an expression has, uh, you know, symbols and it has uh, variables, et cetera. Well, so does a, an equation has uh, symbols and variables, et cetera. And we can say what some of those symbols are, plus, minus, et cetera, and plus, minus, et cetera. And some of the variables might be, you know, actual numbers or uh, x, y, and x, y. And what's really interesting is that the difference, the real distinct difference between an expression and an equation is that, that inside one. of here, these um, symbols, symbols an, ex an equation has an equal sign and an expression doesn't. And so this little guy right here, the equal sign, is what makes this an equation. An equation. When you can actually materialize it in a physical model, it's very simple to just say, oh, okay. That's all I, I need to realize. This is the only difference between this and that. The structural difference is between this and this is this little part. And of course, because think blocks are one-to-one -one parallels with DSRP diagrams, we can have a DSRP diagram that mimics that exactly this um, to show that, hey, you know, really the difference between an expression and an equation is that equal sign. So you start to see that it's pretty hard to make distinctions without part-whole systems. Yep. And it's hard to you know, make part-whole systems without making distinctions. DNS and RNP aren't really working separately. They're working together right. to create meaning. So we've talked about D, distinctions. We have. Uh, made up of what? Uh, identity and other. And we've talked about S, systems made up of? Parts and holes. <coughs> exactly. I didn't know I'd be taking all these tests <coughs> I know, today. That's good. Oh, I should have studied or something. Uh, now we're going to talk about? R. R, relationships. And relationships are really about interaction. They're about two things coming together and sort of 
interacting with each other or transforming each other as a result of that relationship. Isn't that cool? Remember with diagrams, we simply draw two squares, for example, with a circle in the middle and that circle can be the relationship. Well, with this. blocks, we can do basically the same thing just like that. We refer to this all the time as a barbell because it looks like a barbell. Um, so we can do a relationship like that. This thing is related to this thing by this thing. So this could be mom, dad, dad. and so what is this? It could be lots of different relationships in there. Um, but let's just say it's marriage. Make sense? Again, DSRP doesn't stay separate. No. It kind of interacts. So marriage could be its own system. And the blocks sort of tell you that because that block can take some parts. So what are the parts of marriage? What are some parts? Property rights. Property rights. Love. Love. <laughs> so that could be marriage. And then this one's dad. Of course, dad could have some different attributes. A gruff voice. A gruff voice, maybe. A good sense of humor. A good sense of humor, whatever you want to say. And, and kind moms of could have. Very nice. Very nice. Sweet. Sweet, comforting. Cuddling. Or whatever your construct <laughs> is of dads, moms, and marriages. So notice, even though we're making that relationship, we're making a distinction between moms, dads, and marriage. And we're building three different part whole systems. Could we do the same thing, Laura, with three blocks like this? Yes. Could that be mom, dad, and marriage? Yes. Sure. It doesn't really matter too much whether you use mediums or larges or smalls. It's, it's more a matter of what are you going to be doing uh, with that lesson. So well, this could be mom and dad, and that could be marriage. Right. And also what I've seen in classrooms is a lot of times a teacher will like to demo in front of the classroom using the larger blocks and then yep. have kids have mini models at their desk that they're building alongside with the lesson that she's teaching. And what's really cool about that is the structural model is the same, but what Sally thinks goes in these blocks and what Billy thinks goes in these blocks can be totally different. That's a great point because really, fundamentally, uh, DSRP is about seeing the constructs that your kids m are making. So when, when you see what Sally is making, what, what, what goes inside of her dad block and her mom block and her marriage block, or maybe Joey is you know, mom, dad, and divorce. And she, he's going to build a slightly different model, but the underlying structure is very similar or, or even the same. So you're going to get to really see what your kids are constructing. What's really important is that we get students to talk about this relationship, not simply to say that these two things are related, but how are they related? What is the distinction that relates them? And is that actually a whole system itself? that is made up of parts. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes a relationship is much, much more complex when we start to zoom into it. So naming the relationship or explicating it or telling it a, a teacher what it is yep. helps the teacher understand why this connection is happening <clears throat> in the kid's head, not just that it's happening. Sure. If all you ask a kid is, are these two things related? Is a novel and a short story related? And the kid will say, yes. But you don't know much about what's going on in that, inside that kid's head, do you? So now you say, well, well, tell me, what is that relationship? What is the relationship between a novel and a short story? Mm -hmm. What are some of the parts of that relationship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we might even want to bring in what, you know, bigger blocks and say, here's the novel and here's the short story and there's the relationship. Tell me at least three things that are part of that relationship. That's really getting at the kid's construct, and it's really getting at what the kid is thinking, and it's helping that kid to express what they're thinking, rather than simply saying, yeah, they're related. So what if you have something a little more complicated or complex, mm -hmm. where you have, say, three ideas that have, um, say, like solid liquid gas, which mm -hmm. I see all the time, but that it's not just one thing that happens absolutely from there to there can you have more than one absolutely you could you could stack them um, like that yep so sure it could be two relationships yeah and so these relationships with solid liquid and gas are transformations going one way or the other we can talk a lot about the quality of the relationships between two things a relationship could just be an non-descript relationship like like that and you could write what the thing is so this could right. be you know, marriage or, or something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, we're not really saying which way it's going. Or a relationship could be two-way, or yep. it could be one-way. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about earlier with um, 
solid, liquid, and gas is, yep. you know, this is a transformation this way, there's also a transformation Absolutely. that way. Right? Yep. Or you could combine these into one system and say, you know, oh, there's a, a two-way relationship, you know, and, and simply draw the, the arrow so that it's uh, that way. going both ways. What would determine that is the content of your lesson. What are you really yeah, trying to do? what are you trying to is focus a, Is a lesson about causality, interaction, correlation? Feedback, whatever feedback. type of right. uh, or quality of the relationship that you're after. So what if we reverse engineered it, which I saw a really clever teacher do in Texas once, where she said, um, what is one quarter the relationship between? And so she put a big block there. Oh, and then the kids had one. to think of things that could be on either end of it. You're giving the relationship first and asking the kids to rebuild the two things that it's related to. Does so that they make could some have sense? A dollar bill and a coin, a quarter. Yeah. They could have an hour and 15 minutes. Absolutely. Or... And what you've also pointed out here is sometimes we are more focused on the relationship than the two things we're relating. Related. And in that situation, sometimes we'll use a bigger block in the middle because that's more what we're focused on. We're not going to focus on mom and dad. We're going to focus right in on marriage, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and, and so using the bigger block in the middle in a way that sort of emphasizes that we're going to really talk about this relationship, not its parts. Incidentally, this is what doctoral students do to get their PhDs. They're mm -hmm. really focused in on a relationship between two variables. For and that relationship years. becomes For seven years. that their focus of study <laughs> is on this relationship between two variables for, you know, seven years, hopefully less. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing something that's really been done on sort of a big scale in the classroom would be helpful. We have Sarah Lafayette. She's a fourth grade teacher <clears throat> in Virginia. And she used her entire classroom and as many think blocks as she could get her hands on to literally model every single big event in the history of the state of Virginia and then have kids really zero in on the relationships between those yep. big events. And so I want you to watch that and see what we're talking about in the classroom. Well, the whole year we've been studying Virginia history. It's a big focus in, in fourth grade and we had gone through regions, colonial life, I mean all the way up to modern day Virginia and our test is in two weeks. And so we're really trying to review everything that we've studied. And they have to know a lot of information in this fourth grade test. So we've just been working on going through and, and remembering it and, and the importance of each thing and the order. I wanted to find a way to tie everything together in one lesson, which is not an easy thing to do when you're talking about 1492 up until 2009. So I figured why not break them into, into groups and give them each a, a particular conflict or era that we studied and have them break it down and then we could then order them completely from first to to most recent. I just decided to have them generate the list of the major things that we studied to give them the ownership of it. Basically everything that we studied and I had them pick a, a partner to work with and they got to choose the the era that they did and they got their think blocks and that was basically the only instruction that I've given them. I just let them take the think blocks. What we've done, we've looked at the conflicts, we've looked at perspectives, we've looked at sequencing of events using these blocks. Think about that when you are talking about your particular era. Think about if there were two people who had a conflict, two countries who had a conflict, two groups or two um, were there two distinct people who saw something differently. One particular group back there probably had six different ways that they sorted Jamestown out. Native Americans and colonists and how they viewed each other and the conflict they had with each other. While they were doing it I thought it would be cool if we sequenced them all out from beginning to end um, is we have all these separate eras like um, Discovery, Jamestown, Colonial Time, Revolution and I wanted them to see the connection between each time, like what led to discovery to Jamestown. Why did Europe take an interest in North America? Why did they want to start coming? And I thought it was important for them to see the relationship between the two, not that they were two separate events, but that they went together. And, and how Jamestown resulted in colonial life, and how why the colonists started thinking about revolution and why they started thinking that maybe we want to do this on our own. So just to kind of show the natural progression of, of history and, and what, how A causes B and B causes C. And so it was interesting to see how they, they thought they linked. Or the geography, which includes the regions, didn't really fit in 
to the whole thing. I was kind of thinking, oh, great. I, I didn't think this one through, but it ended up working out because they really thought about where they could sort geography into this massive timeline. And that's what I like about Thinkbox is you can't predict that it's going to go in that direction. You know, I couldn't have predicted that I was going to have this oddball that wasn't going to fit anywhere. But the kids, you know, said it, it, it fits everywhere. And, and that's one of the things that I really like about it because I couldn't have predicted that. They are very, very intelligent. I mean, they will ace any test, but this is hard for them. Think blocks are really hard for them, which I find interesting because I would think it would be toward thinkers like them, but it's it's not. It's it's more out of the box, which is not how those two particularly think. So I find it interesting that they they struggle with this. Oh, I, I definitely think this is deepening their their understanding of the content because I think that they they've memorized it and they know, but. I don't think they have processed it, you know, I don't think they have processed, you know, they know the five regions of Virginia, they know the five bordering states, but I don't think they, they took the time to kind of process, you know, the timeline with the blocks, and I think that really aided in, in, in their comprehension of it and understanding. Throughout their education, and probably, you know, they're going to encounter this much more, is, is they're going to do great with memorizing, you know, they're going to they're gonna really excel, but what's going to really take them to the next level is being able to think, which, which they've kind of gotten away with not having to do it because they are so good at school. And you know what? You know the modern day education system is asking of them. You know they're asking them to pass these SOL tests, and they are very good at that. Um, now they are they're great thinkers, and and this is really getting it getting it out, which is interesting. When I see them using the think blocks, I know their motivation is very high. Uh, they're very excited to get these think blocks and get their hands on them and start figuring things out and the energy is higher. Their motivation is very high for these think blocks and, and they seem to really, really like what they do and they seem impressed with themselves when they, with, when they uh, come up with the timeline like that or when they were looking at um, Rosa Parks and the bus driver's view of the bus boycott and the incident where Rosa Parks was forced to give up her seat. They saw it from Rosa Parks' perspective, but they also looked at it from the perspective of the bus driver. Well, anytime you can see the perspective of somebody else, the, you're going to benefit. Um, I think that's something that adults lack, is the ability to see, why did somebody do this, you know? I mean, conflict management and, I mean, when you're, you know, working in a system like a school, when there's so many different personalities and, you know, how people are going to view things and, you know, being proactive about things. and. I mean, the, the way that, you know, society and school is, I mean, they're going to be working with people throughout their lives. And for them to be able to have that, you know, ability to gain perspective and to see other people's viewpoints, I think is extremely valuable. Perspectives. Perspectives. Point and view. Every perspective is made up of a point and a and view, a view. Uh, an observer and the observed, a subject and an object. Remember, with diagrams, what do we do when we're trying to make a perspective? We hash take, marks. Yeah, we take a square, a circle, or a triangle, and we put some hash marks on it to sort of communicate the metaphor of a mirror, almost, yes. like looking at something. So what we're going to do with these is simply draw the hash marks anywhere on the block. So you could draw it here, for example. You could say this is, you know, dog or whatever you want it to be, mm -hmm. and that becomes your perspective. <gasps> the point of your perspective, and then that could have a view. a view, right? So what's a dog's perspective on steak, you know, or something like that. And you can do that on any size. You right? can do that on any size. Could the view be a small block? Sure. Yes. Could the perspective be a small block? Yes. Absolutely. So if, for example, we went back to our earlier thing, so we had the mom and the dad and we had marriage, could I flip any one of these to become a perspective? Absolutely. Mom could be a perspective, obviously. Any block in your entire conceptual model but even could this, be a perspective, sure. Because it's an idea. Yeah. It doesn't so have we to could, be a person. For example, we could look at, um, you know, uh, if this is marriage, we could look at the 18th century from the perspective of marriage. That mm. would be a whole, Wasn't good. you know, dissertation. And I could take different perspectives on this idea of marriage, right? Sure. And all Absolutely. I have to do is change that and make my hash marks here. Yep. So if I wanted to look at marriage from two perspectives. One could be the federal government and one could be a state, yep. say Hawaii or yep. any Yep, and you just 
draw those as perspectives and write federal government, state government. If I do that, then the parts of what go in this block will change, right? Because the federal government has a very specific definition of what marriage can be, i.e. a man and a woman. Yep. But the state allows it to be a various combination of man, woman, and then same sex unions, right? Yeah. Woman, woman, man, man. Yeah. So then what we can teach kids at that moment is that how we define mm. things will change based on the perspective from which we're looking Absolutely. at. Absolutely. And this is a great way to do it because you kind of lay the parts out. These are the parts of this if you're looking from this State. perspective. And these are the parts of this if you're looking from this perspective. And they can even see that there's agreement on one of the parts. And what's really fundamentally interesting about this is that if you take away all the marriage and all the content, federal state marriage and all the content, the same exact structure is playing itself out in things like a playground dispute or, or an international dispute. For example, yeah. you could have a, a playground event that was a, you know, some kind of fight or yeah. disagreement and you could have Joey and Sally yep. and their perspectives on the event could be quite different. And so, you know, this might be Joey's perspective on the event and this mm -hmm. might be Sally's perspective and these are the two things that they share um, so we could you know take those wow. things away and what we see is the existence of these things is where the real conflict is so we can get rid of all this complexity and really focus on how do we resolve this conflict whether you're talking about the Palestinian Israeli conflict or whether you're talking about the Joey Susie playground conflict or the current debate about what is and is not marriage, again, a distinction, or what yep. is and is not torture. Right. These are all perspectival issues that come down to a very, very similar structure. You don't always have to have two perspectives. Nope. One of the things I've seen is when teachers want kids to look at one thing, but from lots of perspectives. Great, great right? example. We call like that a, a perspective circle. We're looking at some event or thing, you know, piece of art, uh, a novel, etc. Well, from so just to, multiple perspectives. to flesh that out a little bit. So this is a piece of art, and mm -hmm. I saw a teacher. She had um, line, color, um, shapes, yep. feelings, and maybe technique or something or, sure. or medium. And so you could do that. You could look at that one thing. Yep. Um, from that perspective. Now, if I had the actual piece of art, I could actually put the piece of art here. Sure, right? Or like a Xerox copy of a painting and say, absolutely. here's Starry Night. You can do the same thing with food from the perspective of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, etc. And we could break down the food from that. So the, the perspective circle, again, is a very universal structure that's allowing you to deconstruct lots and lots of stuff at very deep levels if you want to. You could go get incredibly sophisticated with this, or a little kid can deconstruct a basic fun story from the perspective of the fox, or the, what's the, uh, the three little pigs, or the, uh, it's not a fox, it's, it's a, the, wolf. the wolf. The wolf or the three little yeah. pigs, and they could look at that little story from the, these different perspectives. What's with the box of all this stuff? <laughs> this is a box of stuff. It's a mixture and, um, of stuff. We call this realia. Realia is just a funky word for real stuff. It's stuff other, other than uh, abstract tactile manipulatives. So here you have a, you know, different animals, uh, that type of thing. Or, or for example, you might have some buttons. Um, or the important thing to realize is that think blocks aren't meant to replace things that are easily tangible anyway. I mean, uh, I wouldn't... Um, write leaf on a think block unless mm -hmm. there were just no leaves around. You know, you can go out and grasp a real leaf. So so you don't need it to, for, for that kind of stuff. But if you're breaking down, for example, the uh, cell structure of a, of a plant cell, that's pretty difficult to sort of grasp. So you want to use think blocks for that type of thing. You can use think blocks in combination with any different reality or real life experiences. I remember that one example of that teacher who, who went to the... Um, the, the yeah. corn maze or an apple, the apple, apple orchard, orchard. Yep. and just took a few blocks with him and um, at the end of the field trip just pointed these as perspectives on the field trip itself and said let's look at our field trip experience to the apple orchard from these two different perspectives. So he, there, that's an example of including sort of ab the abstract idea of perspectives with the very mm -hmm. real experience that the kids just had. The other thing that's kind of neat is we can build a model using a 
a part whole system. For example, the five senses, and we could talk about each one and talk mm -hmm. about you know the parts of those. And now we can just turn that whole model that we built the system. into that whole system into a perspective. So now we can use the, in fact, that is the human perspective, believe it or not, which is our five senses on the world. And so not only does this larger system become a perspective, but each one of these subsystems can be a perspective. Uh, and this allows the yeah. kids to sort of chunk it so they don't have to think about it all at once. They could say, let's just look at it from this perspective yeah. and then put that one away. Or let's look at it from this perspective and put that one away. Or let's look at it from all those perspectives. Any model you build can become just flipped to become a whole perspective full of subsystem perspectives. So again, we're integrating D and S and R and P. We're not keeping them separate. Right. Where things really get interesting is like a chef when you start putting them together and those ingredients start boiling into a stew, a cognitive stew, then you really get some cool stuff going on. This module is about think blocks, but one of the most important things for you to take away is that it's not about think blocks. We tried to show you how you know, the logistics in a sense of how think blocks are used. They're transparent, so you can see the parts of an idea. You can draw on them, so you can make them distinctions. And you can show kids the flexibility between and among distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. There's a ton of research that says that using tactile manipulatives, getting them touching and grabbing and mm -hmm. playing and uh, manipulating things physically is really, really important. The, the hand-brain-eye connection is really, really important. But you know, if you don't have a set of think blocks around, you still have to make learning tangible and graspable. Mm -hmm. Always remember, it's not about the diagrams, it's mm -hmm. not about the think blocks, it's not even about the guiding questions, it's about teaching your kids how to think, getting them making distinctions, relationships, mm -hmm. systems, and perspectives. It's not about the tool, it's about the function, the purpose, which is we've got to get thinking back at every desk. <laughs>